a bad setup. I'm glad that uh, we were able to make this setup work to transfer corn between the bins. So now that the corn in the Sioux bin is dry, it has come time to switch it over to the Sioux cup. Now we dry the corn in the Sioux bin because it's got a stirrator in it and it allows it to dry the corn a whole lot better. Whereas the Sioux cup doesn't have stirrators, it does have a dryer. So the corn in the Subin is at 17 and percent. So here is the controller to the AgriDry system. So what the AgriDry system allows us to do is set a target moisture of, let's say, 15%, and we can tell it that it's 17 and percent going in right now. So it'll only turn the fan on when conditions allow for drying, which will save on energy costs because it can only run the fan when you're going to be putting moisture into the bin instead of just 24 7 and um, what it also allows you to do is that let's say you have some really dry beans or something um, let's say you have eight percent beans eight percent moisture beans in your bin and you want to get that up to 11. so what you can do is tell the system that the um, beans that are in the bin are at eight percent and it'll turn the fan on like let's say at night when the humidity is higher um, so that it'll allow more moisture to go inside the bin. Some of you may have seen this zone builder in the background of some of our videos. So this is model 132 and uh, we're gonna do a quick walk around. You know more about it than I do at this point. <laughs> um, I've done a little bit of research on it and um, hopefully the conditions allow for us to get out there in some yeah. soil this fall but uh, if we get the opportunity we're gonna take it. So could you tell us a little bit more about the zone yeah. builder? Yeah, so this is our, our 132 zone builder. It's an auto reset shank. Um, obviously the, the intention of this tillage tool is to get down below the hard pan, uh, break up a lot of the compaction in the soil. Uh, the objective is to get right below that hard pan, um, cut a nice, or uh, break up the compaction, give an area for the water to dissipate when you have high moisture years, and also an area if you are in a dry year for that crop to get down and find the moisture if you need it. Uh, the intention is minimal disturbance, keep as much organic matter uh, in the soil as possible and really not want to turn much dirt, we just want to get down there, get a nice fracture so we can reduce that compaction but still keep good footing um, for getting implements, getting tools in the field, uh, driving tractors in the field and keeping a lot of the organic matter in the soil. Okay. So we all have those areas, especially in our fields where there's a lot of traffic, whether you pull into the field and your trucks are turning around there. Um, for us, we have several areas where we have the trucks and we load them there. Um, also, wherever we stack bales, it just increases those compaction in those areas. And I feel like something like this will be especially useful to break up that compaction there. Yeah, and one thing we'll see uh, working with customers, you go, go throughout the field, you'll see uh, high traffic areas, high compaction areas. You'll see moisture sitting in the field. Um, and a tool like this can really get down, break up that hard pan and give, give us an area for that moisture to dissipate. Um, the thing with, with our 132, it is, it is truly an auto reset model. It's a, it's a toggle trip system as opposed to having a, a spring cushion. So we're, we're maintaining a consistent depth with the shank itself so we can consistently get through and fracture what we need to. Um, it is also designed, like we mentioned, for, for minimal disturbance. So it's a, it's a pretty narrow shank, so we're not turning any soil. And then the wear bar itself in the front is, is designed for low disturbance. You'll notice it's an, it's an hourglass shape. Uh, so at the surface where that shank would come out, you're not going to be turning much dirt. Uh, you'll notice as you run through the field, you'll, you'll see a wave kind of follow the shanks of that ground just getting lifted, breaking up that compaction, and then dropping the soil back down where it was. Okay. So what's the, um, what's the trip for the auto resets? What, how much force can they yeah. sustain before it's, tripping? It's 6,000 pounds of trip force. Okay. And if, if you look on the system, so it is, it is a toggle trip system. You have an inner and outer toggle that work together. Um, and if you do come into contact with an obstruction, those are gonna separate, allow that shank to trip up and out of the way, clear that obstruction. Uh, and then you have your spring canisters that are gonna force that shank back into the ground so you can keep moving. Cool. How much horsepower is required for a unit like this? 
typically on the high end we're looking at about 50 horsepower a shank uh, and and if you're in an area where you haven't subsoiled in the past or really high compacted area um, you're gonna you're gonna be about there obviously the more the grounds worked the more the compactions broken up uh, sometimes those numbers can go down um, but normally about 50 horsepower a shank okay. the, the best thing we can do to, to help pull the machine you know we've got pretty heavy duty colders on the front uh, it's a six bolt hub 1500 pounds of down pressure and what I always recommend to guys is let's get that colder a nice deep cut we can we can get it in the ground up to the hub it is designed to take that so we can have a nice slot for that shank to follow um, so the shanks not trying to form its own path okay. um, that helps a lot with with those horsepower what depth do you want to run at with this typically what we recommend is is working to find that compaction layer in the ground okay. um, and normally we run want to run just below it about an inch below it just so we can get through that hard pan and fracture it you know if, if we go any deeper you're kind of just adding horsepower to something that's not accomplishing much more yep. uh, for you okay. um, or if you if you go any shallower you're not truly getting in and, and breaking up that layer okay compact. so it just varies yeah yep and uh, normally we recommend the guys to take some type of soil probe or go out and test the ground and, and see see what you're working with in the areas that you're going to be subsoiling. Okay, cool. Yeah. What ground are you guys going to be doing it with? You got some high compaction areas you're thinking of running? Or? Yeah, I mean, even if we can't, I mean, we're not planning on doing every square inch of the yeah. farms. Mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned, those high compaction areas, like just beyond the barn here, mm -hmm. um, that's definitely one that I'd like to run it over. And then, yeah. like out of my place where we, we pull in and spin around. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Just a lot of those areas where there's a lot of traffic and you can tell where the compaction is bothering it. Yeah. Every and, farmer's got them. <laughs> yeah. And what we'll notice if you if you drive around the countryside, you'll see spots throughout guys' fields where there's just sitting water. Um, you know, where maybe the cart's been over that area a lot or you had the semi in and out of the field there. Or what what have you, spreading manure, all those types of things. And you, yep. you can tell um, getting a tool in there like that can really help get rid of that moisture. We even see in some parts of the world um, up in the western Canada's uh, area, for example, they get a lot of uh, like saline washouts. So mm -hmm. They have high compaction areas, so it'll pull the salt out of the soil and leave parts of the ground completely barren. I mean, you can't do anything with it. Yeah. And so we've got guys up there uh, trying to utilize these tools to break up that compaction to, to reclaim some of that that ground. Yep. Um, I don't think you guys have the salt problems like they do in that part of the world. Neither do we in Ohio. And thankful for it but mm -hmm. yeah farming in some areas can be tricky it's all about your soil yeah yeah think the 82 can pull it we're gonna find out oh we were just talking about in, in the spring following spring you can see where that uh, where that shank had gone down through the soil the snow is gonna melt where that slot had been made so mm -hmm. the soil ultimately is warming up quicker and really hopefully get out in the field just that much quicker now are these I mean I don't really know a whole lot about subsoiling mm -hmm. typically I'm I, I've seen it done more in the fall but is there ever a situation where you would want to do it in the spring? We will have some parts of the country. If you notice on the back of the shank, there's actually uh, holes located here. We'll have yep. some parts of the country that will do some spring tillage with it, and they'll put a strip builder attachment on the back okay. uh, to, to build a zone that they could plant into. Huh. Um, I know there's some parts of the country where they'll use it as a dual purpose tool. They'll get in a deep rip and then maybe go a little bit shallower and, and build a strip so they can get more than one use out of the, the tool itself. Okay. Um, a lot of times getting it in the fall is helpful because then you have the opportunity as well for that freeze and thaw to get down in there and, and continue to help break up that compaction. What's the spacing on the shanks? Uh, so this is a 30 inch spaced unit. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. We have different spacing offerings, but I'd say 30 is, is probably Standard. the most common. Yeah. And a lot of guys like it too because then I can get a shank, especially in the odd number spacings, like a five shank, I can get a shank going down the same path as my tires, so I'm not essentially adding compaction back into the system. I'm, I'm ripping that path up as well. Mm -hmm. I would say the auto reset model is definitely our most popular, and, and for the fact that you know we we do offer spring cushion models for really tight soils, mm -hmm. um, but the auto reset is definitely the most popular because you you got a shank that's truly controlling the depth, and then if you do run into an obstruction, it's tripping up all the way and getting back in the ground and, and maintaining the depth as opposed to continue riding back and letting those springs compress and maybe not staying at the depth you need to throughout the whole process.
we had a, one of our viewers saw it sitting in the background and they mentioned those auto resets are a miracle in and of themselves. So. Yeah, a lot better than getting out and replacing a shear bolt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, do have, we do have a 112 model, which is a shear bolt shank, and a 122 model, which is a, a spring cushion shank. And all have their, you know, obviously the spring cushion shank has its place for, for different soil conditions uh, that guys come across, but okay. I'd say as a whole, the 132 is probably taken hold as the what's, most popular model. What's the retail on this? You know, Tony, I think it's like 16.5. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is it going on the 8235R? Yeah. Plan? <laughs> I hope it'll pull it. Yeah. <laughs> if you're 50 horsepower shank, I'm doing the math in my head going, wait a dang minute here. <laughs> Might just have to slow down in some spots and yeah, make that'd sure be cool because we've never really put that tractor through its paces before. I'd, yeah, I'd really well. I guess the VT is quite a pull on it, but mm -hmm. you have to try to maintain that speed. Yep, to get the tillage action you need with it. Yeah, something like this. I mean, is there really a, any recommended speed that you got to go? Not, not necessarily. Um, as fast as you can go with the tractor still pulling it. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Do you find any speeds work better? I, I think you gotta you gotta watch it where you don't want to go too fast. Yeah. You don't want to start blowing it. Oh yeah. Especially when yeah. it's drier, you don't yeah. want to be blowing that soil off. You don't want too, too much. much disturbance. Because that's one thing with this 132 that we did uh, opposed to previous models. I mean, you notice how how thin this shank is. Mm -hmm. We really we really just want to get out and fracture that hard pan. We don't want to disturb the surface. Mm -hmm. And it's a straight leg shank. And then you notice the wear bar is an hourglass shape. So right here in the common area where that shank's coming out of the ground, we narrowed that down as well to make sure you don't get that blow up. What are these other holes there for on the shanks? Uh, so we, we have different attachments that we offer. Uh, there's shank protectors that you can bolt on the side of the shank okay. uh, to, to save on shank life. And then there's different attachments. We have wings, uh, that got some like seven inch wide wings. Guys like to bolt on maybe to get a little more lift. Mm -hmm. uh, does add a little bit more disturbance. Um, there's also fertilizer plates you can put on for dry or liquid fertilizer. Some guys will like to put down fertilizer while they're going through that process as well. We do offer attachments as well that you can bolt right to the frame that cover the whole width of the machine like a, a cleated drum or a rolling basket. Cool. Cool. Hoping that within the next two weeks here we can pretty well get everything sold. Yeah. That's why we're trying to push with the truck so hard so we can get some of this fall tillage done. Well, your brother Travis was saying you guys uh, had the opportunity this year to get a truck so you guys could control a little bit of hauling the grain to yeah. town yourself. I want to give Tony and Chris a huge thank you for coming out and talking about both the Unverfirth 1160 as well as the Zone Builder. Now we've had a lot of snow, but I'm kind of holding on hope that we are going to be able to get out there and do some tillage yet this fall. Um, if the snow melts and we have some dry weather, you know, maybe we'll be able to get out there and do some subsoiling. Um, I have a few areas that I really like to hit, but with the weather and the way that it's been, the ground has been frozen today. Uh, thought out and it's been pretty muddy so the bins as of right now are actually full and um, I haven't had a whole lot of time to be editing videos I've been coming home pretty late every night and have been sitting in front of my computer for about 30 minutes every night before I fall asleep and um, I haven't been able to really go into depth in videos all that much just because we've been super busy but um, now that the bins are full, um, Gavilon typically only takes grain until like five o'clock at night. So now I'm gonna be able to have more time to edit videos at night um, just because I'll have more time and we won't be able to be harvesting because once we fill the grain carts up, then we just have to wait until morning before we can keep harvesting. But as of this moment, we have 125 acres, but there's so much more footage yet to come. Um, I hope to get caught up by the end of this week. But anyway, uh, I just want to keep you guys in the loop on what's going on around here. Um, I hope you all have a great Sunday. Thank you for watching How Farms Work, and be sure to stay tuned as more harvesting videos come out. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.